Managing Director of the NAELB Lease Broker School, Gary Green, serial entrepreneur and salesman since the age of eight, says, This is a great time to build a business as a financing professional, as it's all about helping other businesses grow and improve their profits. In good times and bad, businesses always need access to capital and to the equipment which helps them to operate with maximum efficiency and minimal capital to invest. Gary shares his info to help the small business next on Revenue Chat. Hi everyone, this is Tony D'Urso with Revenue Chat. With us we have Gary Green, who is all about helping other businesses grow and improve their profits. He's the Managing Director of the NAELB Lease Broker School. That's the National Association of Equipment Leasing Brokers, NAELB, which is a 25-year-old professional trade association and they present a unique training opportunity to develop independent lease brokerages, but with the support of a national trade association and the encouragement and guidance of hundreds of friendly and helpful competitors. A serial entrepreneur and salesman since the age of eight, Gary began his capital equipment leasing career in 1984, and he learned hundreds of ways to enhance service to clients build professional income earning ability, and how to operate a light and nimble virtual business with clients across the country. Gary says the business can be run from anywhere in the world, and he proved it. For 14 months, he ran his commercial leasing business from the edge of the jungle in the mountains of western Panama in 2013 and 14. Currently, Gary is one of four active leasing professionals who serve as instructors for the NAELB Lease Broker School. And the school's website is naelbschool.com. All right. Gary's going to help us build a business as a financing professional. Let's bring him on. Hello, Gary. How are you? I'm doing very well, Tony. Very well, indeed. Glad to get to speak to you and your audience. Awesome. Good. Well, I'm very grateful to have you on this show. I thank you for being with us on Revenue Chat, and I can't wait to jump into some of the questions, and I'm very interested in some of the points of what you've done. But before I do that, Gary, I mentioned a little bit about you, and perhaps you'd like to fill us in a little more on your roots and how you became an expert in your field. Gary, how did it all start for you? Well, let me go back from uh, at least just before I got into this business. Before I was in the commercial equipment leasing business, I was a real estate broker. I had my own brokerage, uh, my own property management company, and it was a fun, fun business, but it frankly burned me out. I was in in the glory days of the real estate business, and then I was in for some really gory days of the real estate business when nobody could buy or sell anything because a, a mortgage was 16% if you qualified and if the seller paid lots of points. So I get into property management, and that burned me out. I was just going too many ways for too many people and there was no time left for me. And I just, I was going to kill myself (laughs) before I I decided, before, (laughs) now I I was going to kill myself by working is what I mean to say, not so (laughs) I was going to kill myself working and I decided that, you know, there has to be something better to do. And so I sold my interest in my real estate company to my partner and went looking for something new and exciting. A friend referred me to a small equipment leasing brokerage in Tucson, Arizona. That's where I was living. That's where my real estate company was. And so I went over and I interviewed and I took their offered sales position. I found out that I really liked the business. Used many of the same skills that I had from the real estate business. You know, basically being the knowledgeable professional in the transaction who takes on the challenges of a specialized business or service and makes it easy for the other parties to the transaction. And that's, that's what we get paid for as equipment leasing brokers too, knowing more about the specialized process of equipment financing than our clients do. Tony, I said I really like the business. That's not completely true. I love the business. Cool. I got to be a hero to business people who are growing and improving their business, optimistic about the future, 
take charge kind of people. And I got to be the catalyst, the, the agent, the, the person who had the missing link, the necessary resource to help them grow their business and operate their business with greater efficiency and, and productivity. I had paid a nice commission too. Uh, broker fees is uh, the, the polite way of saying it, but yeah, it's a, it's a sales commission for bringing the parties together and, and making it all happen. And uh, you know, I'm a capitalist and proud of it, so I'm not not embarrassed to say that I get paid nice commissions and broker fees for doing what I do. But here's the deal: the most important thing for me and for lots of the other folks in our industry is that I get to feed my innate curiosity about business, what entrepreneurs do, how they do it, how they improve on it, why they do what they do, what their challenges are, what their solutions are. I hear people describing solutions to problems that I didn't even know existed. I get to meet dentists and bakery owners, mechanics, landscape contractors, architects, lawyers, farmers, and priests in what I do. And I learn a little bit about each of their businesses, their industries, as I'm getting to know them. You know, feeding my curiosity, that's just really huge for me. It's just kind of the way I'm wired. And, and I think lots of the folks who, who love the business like I do also get a great kick out of that. So anyway, I told you I, I, I was referred to this other small leasing brokerage in Tucson, Arizona. I actually work for three different leasing companies before going out on my own and forming my lease brokerage in 1988. The first two companies, Tony, they taught me a lot about what not to do. I mean, that's valuable. You know, I mean, you, you get to learn that too. And, and in fact, maybe those are some of the most valuable lessons. But it was the third company that I worked with they taught me in two years' time lots of really great information and understanding of the business that I didn't have uh, before. The, the, the owners took me under their wings and um, you know, shared with me all sorts of stuff about how to work with vendors. These are the equipment dealers who are selling the, the asset that needs financing. How to work with end users, those are the entrepreneurs who need the equipment. Uh, how to understand credit analysis, structuring transactions for win-win-win solutions. And it's kind of interesting. The first two leasing companies I worked for were brokers. They didn't use their own funds. They were always taking the, um, you know, the information that they had about a particular customer, and they would go find an investor, a funding source, sometimes a bank, but more often private uh, or um, professional investment houses that specialize in buying equipment financing and equipment leasing transactions. So the first two leasing companies I worked for were brokers, but the third one was self-funded. It was a couple of, I'll just say they were rich old guys, and, and bless their hearts, they, they, uh, they really made it fun, they made it easy to catch on to what was going on. But when I started with them, as I said, they were, they were rich old guys, and they either approved the transactions and funded themselves, funded the transactions themselves, keeping the payment stream and the earnings for their own portfolio, where they simply flat turned it down. And my boss, he, I mean, he was a smart man, and he explained it this way. He said, Gary, I already got the money in my pocket. The only reason I want to take the money out of my pocket and put it into somebody else's business is to get it back with a profit on top of it. But I already got the money in my pocket, so he, you know, he, was, he was just a conservative guy. And I understand that. I completely relate to that. Anyway, one day, I'd been there for a few months, and one day I asked my boss if he would mind if I took the transactions that he was turning down, his declines, and see if anybody else would buy them and pay us a broker fee or a commission on those very same transactions that he was turning down. He allowed me to do exactly that. I went out and built relationships with investment houses, investment companies that fund equipment leases, and they paid us commissions on the transactions when they got approved and funded. That was fairly early in my two years with, uh, with this third leasing company. By the end of that two years that I was working there, my boss and his partner, they were funding less than 10% 
of the transactions that I generated, and more than 90% were being brokered out for fee income for us, for, you know, for the company. I mean, hey, and my boss and I, we were splitting the profits on it, so it's not like he was out in the cold. He was glad to see this go this way, too. And I, I tell people, I thought I was going to show my boss all the good business he was turning away. I was going to get him to soften up on his tight credit criteria, and I never got that to happen. But uh, we were both happy. Uh, I was I was making money. He was making money. He got to invest when he wanted to invest, and he got to make simple fee income when he didn't feel like it was the right investment for him. And this business, hey, gosh, there are so many different business models. For this guy, Harold is his name. He 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 was my boss in the third leasing company, and his business model was lots and lots of eggs in lots and lots of little bitty baskets. He was funding transactions of $2,000 to maybe $50,000 and probably averaging closer to $10,000 than than the bigger ones. That was the way he was comfortable doing things. And there are others in our industry then and others in our industry now that only wanted to do transactions of $100,000 or more or only want to do transactions in certain states or regions or types of equipment. Oh, that's fine. It's just different business models. Anyway, uh, I got to be making fee income for him and for us by selling lease transactions to entrepreneurs who needed the funding. And then I would turn my ball cap one third of the way around and I would go sell that customer and his credit worthiness and his optimism and his business plan, I would go sell that to an investor, a bank, if you will. And then sometimes they were actually banks, but usually, as I say, they're just uh, companies that invest in lease transactions. That's their business model. So I want to back up a bit, uh, Tony. I, I, I say selling leasing, but this is really a different kind of sales than what many people may think of. Uh, as, as sales. For one thing, it's an intangible. A leasing salesperson sells money, if you want to think of it that way, where they sell the use of a productive asset for a business person's use. For example, Tony, I mean, if you got a customer out there, you got, you've got a client or a listener out there who's got a, a business manufacturing widgets, and They have identified that they can get themselves a widget processor that allows them to double their productivity with half as many staff. And they take that doubled productivity and half as much staff and they figure out that it's going to save them, for round number purposes, it's going to save them $10,000 a month by having this asset in the business. Do they care who owns the asset? They really don't. They need the use of the asset, but they don't really care who owns it as long as they get to use it. Now, the other thing to understand is that if they're adding, say, $10,000 in my example here, $10,000 a month to their bottom line by having this widget processor, and I can deliver that machine and and have have somebody set it up in their location at a cost of a monthly lease payment of, again, taking, for example, purposes, $2,000 a month. Are they inclined to do that? Well, the answer is yes. In fact, if I could give them the same 500% return on investment next month on a different asset and the month after that on yet another asset, we will be doing business together for a long time. So our clients are 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 really entrepreneurs who need either the the funding for the asset or they really identified that the asset itself is going to help them solve a problem somehow in their business. The other thing that's unique about selling leasing is that we are simultaneously soliciting for new business while turning away new business. You might already have figured out the reason is that some people are not credit worthy. They don't have a habit, a history, and a character, frankly, that demonstrates that they pay their bills. And we are not buying a piece of equipment and putting it into a business owner's business location just so that we can get it back. 
we're put, we're buying it, we're putting it into the business owner's location and into their operations so that we get a return on our investment. And that return on investment hopefully isn't the equipment. It might be later down the road, you know, two, three, four, five years from now, maybe we'll get the equipment back used and dusty and greasy or something. But the business model is that we want a return of investment and a return on investment. So that's what we're selling. When I say we're, I, I sell leasing, I'm really selling this intangible with this uh, simultaneously. Uh, I, I, I have this mental picture of a, a policeman waving traffic through the intersection while holding traffic out of the intersection simultaneously. And I'm, I'm kind of doing the same thing with clients, simultaneously soliciting new business while turning away those who are not, qu- not going to qualify. So anyway, that's kind of a background on the business. And our... Um, our trade association, I think you mentioned the National Association of Equipment Lease Brokers, the NAELB. We are celebrating our 25th anniversary in less than two months' time of the big annual conference in Las Vegas. The NAELB is a broker's organization for brokers and by brokers. We have funding sources who are members and they buy business from us brokers. They buy these transactions that we bring to them. And so they get to be members of the association as funding source members, but the funding source members don't have any vote. It's a, it's a trade association by brokers and for brokers. All the board members are, are active lease brokers uh, and the funding sources are there in order to have access to us. About three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, we started working on developing the NAELB school. The school is a one week long intensive class where we teach entrepreneurs how to be professional and how especially to succeed as equipment leasing brokers. We cover the industry from nuts and bolts to credit analysis, packaging, matchmaking of a particular business to a particular investor, structuring a transaction, you know, where maybe the payments start out very low in year one of the lease and they get a little bit bigger in year two or year, you know, year three, something like that. Or, you know, if you're going to lease some equipment, for instance, to a, um, a ski resort, they get most of their revenue in three or four months out of the year. And so maybe we will structure a transaction such that we get paid lease payments big lease payments three or four months out of the year, and very small lease payments eight or nine months out of the the year. So that's uh, that's what I mean by structuring. We get into the legal and the ethical issues of the business. It is, um, and I mentioned earlier that there's credit issues that, uh, that cause people to not qualify. And there's also, you'd never believe this probably, Tony, but there are frauds. There are people who will claim to be who they're not and, uh, you know, stolen identities or whatever in order to get access to a piece of equipment that they wouldn't otherwise qualify for. And so we, tr- we train the legal and the ethical issues and how to be really good detectives um, and how to, how to figure out that you know, something isn't right about this and, and go, to, go, go about figuring out, is my intuition wrong or is my intuition right? And I'm just going to uh, put some distance between me and this particular customer, perhaps doesn't happen very often, but you better know about it before it happens to you. And that's why we spend some time teaching about it in our class. We spend a full day talking about sales and marketing, how to present yourself and distinguish yourself from the competition. Uh, We get into the best practices for operating your business efficiently and portably with minimal expense and maximum profitability. And I'll come back to that more uh, more in, in a moment here. Our students come into class. We, we've we've had you know some significant uh, conversations with them be, uh, by phone before we meet them the first time at a, a welcoming dinner on Sunday. But they start Monday morning uh, with a uh, nuts and bolts, basically describing everything from here's what a broker is, here's what a broker does, here's a little bit of the basics of understanding credit. Uh, you know, we might basically talk about A credits, B credits, and C credits, and C minus or D credits, and so forth like that. And those are kind of generalities, and we'll get into some of the specifics of them. What we don't talk about, I, ours is a very specialized industry. Tony, we, we, we 
teach the broadest and deepest understanding of a very specialized industry with tax implications, with collateral considerations. Um, we, we talk about the location issues, credit issues, and we discuss in great detail how to understand the customer so that we can tell their story. And that's so key, to tell the story of an applicant who he's, he's a genius as a baker, or he's a, uh, an absolute wizard as a widget maker, but he doesn't know how to apply for financing and get the right end result. So that's what we spend a lot of time talking about. We avoid as a matter of fact, getting into discussions about commercial mortgages. There are other companies, other, other training facilities who will get into that if somebody wants to do that. We, we don't get into talking about leveraged buyouts or factoring or viaticals or, you know, uh, merchant cash advances. Those other resources are there. Those other, uh, you know, the products and solutions are available. But we struggle, frankly, to get all that we want to get into our five-day class or four-and-a-half-day class, we struggle to get it all in because there's just so much. We want to make sure that people are capturing it, that they're really getting it as we're talking about it. So that's uh, that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it and, and why I am so keen on it. I love the business. Uh, I was involved on the board of directors when the school was kind of conceptualized and it became my pet project, and I couldn't be happier with it. It's, it's been so cool to see it come to fruition, have students go through and uh, come out of it with a solid understanding and go off and start making money. And I get to run into these students now at our, our annual conferences and our regional conferences, and they tell me about the successes that they're having. That's really cool, too. Really cool. Oh, and one other thing, I mean, we, we talk, we've got this week-long class followed immediately, almost always immediately, and, and, and in the case of our November uh, class that we're putting on, excuse me, our Las Vegas class in April, followed immediately by our big annual conference where our graduates and all of the other members of our association, but especially our graduates, have their first opportunity to meet and get to know the lenders, the investors, the, the ones who want to buy transactions from our brokers and approve them, fund them, and pay commissions or broker fees to our brokers. So that happens uh, immediately after class. And then to make sure that there's a good long-term um, success, we provide a dedicated mentor to each of our graduates. Depending upon the particular business model that any one of our graduates would have identified as appropriate for themselves, big ticket, small ticket, trucks, trains, aircraft, restaurant equipment, software, whatever it may be, everybody's got a unique market that they can, that they can approach. We try to make an appropriate match to a good mentor. I, I get to be uh, like, uh, uh, who was it? Yentl was the, uh, the, the matchmaker, right? In the... Uh, Barbara Streisand movie. And, you know, so I want to make the, the most appropriate match for a, a student and the kind of business they think they're going to do with an experienced broker who's already a member of our trade association, already doing business at least similar to what our student, our graduate plans to do, so that they can say, if this were my transaction, I would take it to lender A or lender B, or you know, funding source number C, or whatever, because they will know the appetites of the different lenders that are out there and, and approving and buying and paying commissions on the business that our brokers generate. So that's a really key thing. For a year, the mentor is there to help the graduate of our school be successful and close the business. Uh, they're not there to help them sell to bring applications in, but once the application is in, help them to understand the transaction, help them to ask the right questions, help them to package it, get it approved, and then most importantly, get it funded for a good healthy profit for the broker and a win-win-win situation for everybody involved. The vendor gets to make his sale, he gets paid cash, 
the customer gets the equipment that he's going to need to operate his business more efficiently, more effectively. The lender has an investment that's paying them back return of investment and return on investment. That's certainly the intention. There's an insurance company who even gets to uh, write a little bit bigger insurance policy. It, it's a really a win-win-win sort of a business. And again, that's kind of why I get, uh, get excited about it. And man, I'm so eager to <laughs> share it with folks. Well, your enthusiasm comes through so strong and loud and clear, Gary. Very cool, fascinating, so many points of topic and conversation that you brought up. What an industry. Wow. Where do I start? (laughs) Gary, for someone that wants to get in this, obviously the industry is huge. It covers any equipment, vehicles, gosh, anything you need to operate a business. What kind of background does the person need in order to succeed in this industry like can it be just anybody obviously you don't want someone just fresh out of college or do you well you know fresh out of college wouldn't be a reason not to um i think it really there's lots of attributes that i think will will help uh help somebody to be successful I, i i would say sales ability but not necessarily Moxie is the word. I'm a kind of a, a comfortable confidence to engage in conversation with all kinds of business people. And it, so you might think of that as a sales ability, but it's really just being comfortable in your own skin and thoroughly engaged in and allowing your curiosity to run with you. And, and there's a, a wise salesman, Zig Ziglar, said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so that would be, as a personality trait, uh, something that the, uh, a candidate would really be curious and excited to follow their curiosity. And that might express itself as moxie, the ability to engage in conversation with somebody who five minutes ago was a stranger, uh, but uh, we were referred to each other because I thought maybe we could get to do some business and help each other to grow. And so sales, but, but certainly not a hard sell, more of a consultative selling process. They should have some communication skills, uh, you know, be, be able to write clearly, speak clearly, avoid jargon. There's plenty of jargon in the industry, but most of the end users, the customers don't know, uh, you know, what TIB or PUT or, or, you know, these other acronyms mean. Those are industry, industry lingo. And so you would talk to um, a customer about their time in business, not their TIB or their purchase upon termination, not their PUT or, or uh, something like that. To better understand email, obviously, you got to be you got to be able to trade information fast and efficiently. I, I do a lot of text messaging these days, uh, and that that serves me well. I'd say they should probably, well, possibly at least, hey, have some presentation skills, especially if they're going to go call on a equipment dealer and ask the equipment dealer for their financing referrals. That's not necessary, but it, but it's, it's an important part, at least, of how I built my business. Let me take a side trip here with you just a moment. I get most of my business from equipment dealers. Think about the last time you went and bought yourself a new vehicle. Tony, you're out there talking to a salesperson. He had you sit in several vehicles and take several of them around. And you found one that you like. It's going to meet your needs perfectly. And now all they got to do is provide the financing for it. And so the salesperson takes you into the dealership's finance office. My business is very much like that finance office, except I'm not in the dealership. I'm not at the restaurant equipment dealership's uh, office or his, uh, his warehouse. I'm not at the medical equipment's dealership. I'm not at the software dealership or anybody else. I work from my office, but these people who have sold a customer on a solution to the customer's equipment needs, if only we can make it affordable for them, right? I've mentioned a little bit ago, this, this guy who's got a widget processor and it's going to make him $10,000 uh, in additional profit each month, that's 
nothing more than a dream if he hasn't got the five or six figure purchase price to acquire it unless he's got a leasing company that's willing to invest in it for him right so i get my business from re- from referrals of equipment dealers who have sold their customer on the solution if only there's a, a, an affordable financing arrangement on it and that's what i do so I, I mentioned communication skills and making you know possibly presentations i get a lot of business from uh, from companies who will bring together their sales team and let me make a presentation. You got to stop talking about a thirty thousand dollars sale and start talking about it as nine hundred dollars a month, because your customer may not be able to afford thirty thousand dollars, but if it's making them five thousand dollars a month, they can certainly afford nine hundred dollars a month, right? Absolutely. So that's 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 the communication skills that I'm getting at there. I mentioned a moment ago, curiosity. You got to you gotta really just get a kick out of understanding how business works, how a lease investor views their ideal customer, what they will and won't do, about how, how entrepreneurs do what they do and why. I think one of the most important aspects of a successful person in the leasing business is attention to details. The details will trip you up if you're not paying attention. You misunderstood when they said this and they meant that, or you yourself got hung up in their lingo, perhaps, and you you made an assumption about what they meant when they meant something entirely different, or eh, just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Curiosity will help you uh, overcome a lot of that because you get to ask questions. Really? Tell me more. I never knew that. Tell me more. And, And so my clients... Entrepreneurs who want to build their business, they are glad to talk to me about their business. And so it's a win-win situation that way as well. Sales, not necessarily. Communication skills, curiosity, and attention to detail. And I would say if one of those is perhaps a deal killer, if you are not one that's into detail, this is maybe not the best industry for you to be in because it'll just be frustrating and for you and for investors and for clients alike. Very cool. I'm getting this. Very interesting. Gary, so the income that or commission broker fee is not a one-time, is it? As the client is making payments, do you as the broker get, get the payments as well or do you get it all up at once? I We get a broker fee paid up front at the same time that the equipment dealer gets paid for his equipment package. We get paid for bringing the customer in. And I didn't mention it before. You, you didn't ask, but let me, let me talk about fee income. Our professionals, and we get paid a professional's income, ranging from sometimes just as little as 1%, and that's going to be on the very big transactions to as much as 15% of a of the funding amount on a transaction. So if I'm funding a $50,000 widget processor for our client and I'm making 15%, I can make a $7,500 broker fee on that transaction. My customer gets the equipment he wants at a nice affordable payment that he's making profits from, you know, his first or second day of processing widgets each month and everybody's everybody's happy on it. Yeah. Bigger ticket transactions are going to be more competitive as in more rate sensitive. Smaller ticket transactions are less so uh, and in less work but uh, but perhaps a bit more in my business model, I do a lot of small ticket transactions and not a lot of the big ticket transactions. My particular business model, in fact, I average about $22,600 per transaction. Uh, I do them as small as $5,000. i have done them as large as, I think the largest one I ever worked on personally was $570,000 for a couple of cranes for a customer. But uh, back to everybody gets to do their own business model. There are folks in our industry who only do million dollar transactions. And you know what? They can probably do three or four transactions a year. And me, I'm running to do um, five to 15 transactions a month. (laughs) That's just the way it goes. I like the business. I, I like my particular niche of the business. But I do also see and respect the fact that somebody else does something different. 
There, there are folks in our industry who only finance aircraft and others who only finance trains and others who, you know, only finance farm animals. Yes, I did say farm animals. Uh, a fair number of those are leased, believe it or not. It's a producing asset. There you go. Gary, how long does it take to build a steady cash flow as a commercial lease broker? <laughs> the only answer I can give you with absolute certainty, Tony, is it depends. It depends on how hard somebody wants to work at it. We do have folks who get into this business and operate it very much as a sideline or a part-time business, and they're happy with that. And there's others who come into it from just with a strong desire and a motivation to get out, and they just, uh, you know, bust their own chops every day. How many more calls can I make today than I made yesterday? Uh, and so it depends it is the only solid answer. I'd say it also uh, would help if somebody already has perhaps a network of businesses that they have called on before. Maybe they were an outside salesperson calling on warehouses or calling on restaurants or calling on, you know, accountants or, or whatever it was, but they already have a network of business people that they can go they say, hey, I am in the commercial equipment leasing and commercial equipment financing industry. What can I help you with? And that's a, it's really strange because the doors swing wide open. Virtually everybody either has a need or maybe they just had a need and they just got it solved by their bank a little bit ago or by another leasing company a little bit ago. Or their brother is also an entrepreneur and needs some, something. And so people, you know, business people know who else is out there and has a need right now. I'm sorry, Tony, I'm not giving you a very specific answer. And I'm really intentionally so because I don't want to give anybody a false expectation. There are people, in fact, there are graduates of our school who within a year's time are making $100,000 annual income and growing from there. Will everybody do that? Of course not. But it's absolutely within the realm of possibility. Okay, I got you, Carrie. And now we get to the question I've been waiting to ask you on this interview, which I really have a lot of other questions pending <laughs> the answer to that. And that will also help tell us more about a person growing their business. You said that this business can be performed anywhere in the world, and you proved it. You, here you are, an American, and you worked <laughs> on this business, and you know the question. You worked on this in Panama, of all places, in 2013 and 14, in the jungle, around the edge of the jungle. So you got to tell me this story. Regale me, Gary. Okay. <laughs> How did this happen? <laughs> all right. First of all, I have to tell you, I swore it couldn't be done. It was just not possible. I, my old business model was that I had an office in downtown uh, Tucson, and I had a staff of, uh, of assistants, and I had a room full of file cabinets full of paper. And uh, very much, I went through yellow highlighters by the gross. I, I would go through a case of paper every month. Now I make a ream of paper last more than a year. And so I went from swearing you could never be in this business paperlessly to saying there must be a way to do this. And I did. And so I, I took that room full of file cabinets and all of the documents that were in them. And I had one of my staff, I said, start scanning label them, number them in a way that I can understand where to find them and start to archive them. And that was a six-month project, I think. But I was motivated, Tony, because my parents were now 83 years old. They moved to, retired to this uh, neat little mountain village in the mountains of western Panama. And I wanted to be able to spend as much quality time with them as I could. And so I just set about... Uh, researching and figuring out how to do this. I had to invest in a scanner. I had a scanner before, but I invested in a better one. I think I spent, oh my gosh, probably $300 on a good scanner. I invested in an expensive piece of software, uh, Adobe Acrobat uh, Professional, and I, I don't know, I think that was probably $400. And so I started to look at this and I say, shoot, for, uh, that's less than what I'm paying for rent and a phone bill now. This is starting to look easy. 
And so it just, I, I set about uh, making it a task for myself to figure out all of these sorts of things. I got myself a phone number that was portable and allowed me to answer the phone in Panama over Skype, as a matter of fact, and nobody knew where I was. And so I didn't have to, it's not like I was hiding that, but if I'm going to make a lot of calls today and be productive in my business, I can't take 20 minutes talking to each customer and say, yes, it's a great thing. I'm looking out at this dormant volcano here in Panama, and I've got some goats and sheep in my yard, and the jungle is right over there. I saw some great toucans out in the trees yesterday. So how I did it was was first by deciding that it must be possible and then uh, just set about making the business portable in every possible respect. So today I can pick up my laptop, put it into my laptop bag. I probably will pack a headset because I like to have my hands free and my fingers on the keyboard. And anywhere that I have an internet connection and a little bit of privacy, because I'm talking to people about their credit and their finances and that kind of stuff, and I don't want somebody peeking over my shoulder and seeing somebody's tax return. That just wouldn't be right. But the uh, patio at the beachfront resort, or yeah, I could even take a phone call out on the golf course or something like that. Anywhere I have a little bit of privacy and an internet connection, everybody's got an internet connection on their cell phone these days, but you probably want something a little more robust than that. You can do this business from anywhere. And I indeed demonstrated that, proved it after first getting over the fact that I couldn't do it. I had to, had to uh, <laughs> argue with myself one more time that, yeah, there must be a way to do this. And I'm so glad I did. I spent a year uh, in some of the best possible quality time in this little mountain village in Panama. And uh, uh, I, it'd probably still be there, except I had some some issues that brought me to Florida, some business and some health issues that uh, brought me and my family here to Florida. So right now I'm a Floridian. Wow. What an amazing story. Gary, did you do any advertising? Did you have referrals? Did you do email campaigns? How did you get your business? I do all of that now. And I don't do a lot of advertising. Most of my business comes from those equipment dealerships the dealers, actually the salespeople who are, you know, frontline out there dealing with and helping their customers identify a technology or a piece of equipment solution to their customers' needs. So my particular approach was to go for the referrals from equipment dealers. That's not the only way to do it. You can get referrals from accountants. You can get referrals from bankers. You can get referrals from lawyers and landlords, landlords of uh, you know warehouse properties, commercial landlords who have people moving in and out. And he, he, you know, a, a commercial landlord would know who is going to need some warehouse shelving, some conveyor systems, some exterior signage, some uh, refrigeration, uh, you know, whatever it is. So there's lots of ways to go building a business. And key for me is that I also work really, really hard to get the repeat business with folks. Not just the vendor who referred his customer to me because I want him to refer his next customer to me, but also from... Uh, you know, uh, it, it was a, uh, a restaurant equipment dealer who referred me to a food service provider. Well, I want to find out what else the food service provider, whether it's a bakery or a restaurant or a, a bar or nightclub or something, I want to find out what else do they need. And from there, they introduce me to uh, the sign company that they want to get a sign from or the music company that's, uh, that's replacing their uh, public address and their sound system in there on, on, you know, over the dance floor or whatever. So there's, you, know, you just kind of network by taking really good care of the folks you get to do business with and asking them, uh, what else might we do for you? Here's the, th- here's the thing. Entrepreneurs are always identifying and solving problems. And I get to be part of helping them solve those problems. You know, if you, if you ask them, what, uh, what are the other problems that you're facing with? They'll tell you. And they've already, already identified a solution probably. And now they're just a matter of uh, how to get it funded, how to pay for it. That's where I come in. I got you. Sounds like a very interesting job and position that one can really grow in, especially for the people 
and there's, I think a lot of us love talking to others. So if you like talking to other people and helping other people, this seems like just a great fit to just help businesses grow. And yes, win, win, win. And the more you think about it, the bigger, I thought, I thought at first that equipment leasing might be a small niche, but it's actually very, very large. It encompasses every yes. business and any business because and when, when you look at any business, there's always, almost always something that they can do that would bring them more revenue, more profits, more customers, and there's equipment or a software or animals <laughs> at the bottom of it. Yeah, yeah. And every business has a limit to their resources. I have done leasing to IBM. I have done leasing to Motorola. How interesting. I've, I've done leasing to banks. And to business business owners who there's a guy in Tucson who uh, who owns an, uh, virtually every kind of tar- car dealership there is in Tucson, and he also at one point owned the bank, and I was leasing to his car dealerships while he owned the bank. So every business has uh, has restraints on their resources. Uh, even if they have capital, they have to keep certain amounts of capital free for opportunities that come up. You know. Um, so yeah, everybody is a is a potential customer. Okay. And what advice would you give to someone, Gary, who is starting in this business? Especially the advice that you wish you had when you started. Well, re- really, two things. The first one is that you uh, you have to set aside your blind optimism sometimes. There are simply lost causes, and the sooner you can identify a lost cause and know that there is no chance for me to solve this particular customer's problem because they have just extraordinarily crummy credit or because they want you to ship a piece of equipment to Bolivia or because of uh, you know something else that, that just makes it outside of your area of expertise you got to identify that as quickly as possible and then either pass them along to somebody who might be able to help them or simply say, I'm sorry, this is not the kind of transaction that I can help with. I wish you well. I sincerely hope that you find a solution and, and that you're successful in your endeavor, but it just isn't for me. So that would be the first thing. You can spend lots and lots of time wasted on lost causes, hopeless transactions. The second thing, and which I'm really keen on, is that when I got into the business, I learned by making all of my own mistakes. That's such a hard way to do stuff. It really is, you know. And and so when when they started talking about it at uh, the board level of the National Association of Equipment Leasing Brokers, they started talking about putting together a school and how it w- would work and how it would help to guarantee uh, success for folks who were getting into this business. I thought, man, if only that had been available when I got into the business. Now, I'm in this business now for 20 years. Now, for a total of 32 years, but for 28 years on my own, 27 and a half years. And when I got into the business, you know, I I had to learn by trial and error. There wasn't a school that made it possible to, you know, come and learn. There wasn't even a trade association 28 years ago. The NAELB was formed 25 years ago. And so... By having the the trade association, I at least get to attend conferences and educational sessions and most importantly get to network with other folks and I get to say, I have an issue, I have a challenging transaction, who can help me with this one? Who knows what the solution is? And so I may not know the answer myself, but I know somebody who does have the answer. And so networking and being a part of a association of a couple hundred professional lease brokers who are doing very similar work to what I'm doing, different niches, different markets, different areas of expertise perhaps, but somebody out there has run into a sort of a similar problem and they knew how to solve it and so that's been really key. And if you're going to be successful in this business, you'd want to be involved in that and I really think obviously you'd want to get some training. I mean if you're I mean otherwise you're going to struggle for a year or two while you cut your teeth and you make mistakes and you redo documents because you missed this point or that point, you know, whatever it may be. 
uh, the expense the the mistakes can be expensive and we help to train people in how to anticipate and avoid those mistakes as they're working on transactions that would be my my advice is to don't try to do this alone and certainly don't try to do it learning your all of your own mistakes uh, or or uh, trial and error that's just the lot wrong the long hard way but the wrong way to do it I got you, Gary. Basically, get proper training, and that's where the NAELB school comes in because there's now a school and people to help train someone who wants to get in, in on this exciting career. We have a few minutes left. Is there? Can you? Let's talk about the school and anything else that you would like our audience to know about on this, please. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I almost need to apologize. I've been talking about what it's like to be a professional capital equipment leasing and financing broker, and I get carried away. I really do. Uh, yeah, sometimes you got to stop me. My, my wife will roll her eyes and say, there he goes again. But I, I just get so uh, jazzed about it, so charged up. Um, I love ins- it. No, keep going. <laughs> uh, your enthusiasm is there, your integrity, you're zoned in, you're focused, you're successful, you're doing well in this. It shows. Just <laughs> r- rock on, it's, man. <laughs> it's it's an, ex- an inspiring business. I get to be a hero to people. Uh, I, and my clients thank me. The doors swing wide open when I come back to see them again six months later, or three years later, or five years later. Uh, I can call on them. I can I can uh, you know enjoy a, a dinner out with them, or just uh, stop by and say hi and see what's going on with my clients. So that's really really cool. It's emotionally rewarding to me that way. It's financially rewarding. I get I get paid nice healthy broker fees on the transactions that I'm taking to investors. And I didn't talk about it. And it's really not, we, we don't discuss this much even in our school, but our graduates and lease brokers will gain an understanding of what makes a transaction good and what makes a transaction bad and to be avoided. And they'll be able to start making investments themselves in certain kinds of transactions. And whether the broker wants to invest in only triple A kinds of credits where the risk is very low, or B or C credits where the risk is high but the rewards are huge. Um, you know, they, they'll get to kind of cherry pick the transactions that are right for them, and I have done a fair amount of that as well. Uh, I broker what I can broker, and I invest in those transactions where somehow or another I feel more solid about a particular customer than perhaps I'm able to communicate or persuade my investor. They, they look at it and they say, nah, sorry, that one just has a little more risk than I'm comfortable with. I'm seeing it with less risk than they ought to be, uh, than, you know, plenty of comfortable for them, for, the, for them to invest in it. And I'll say, you know what, I'm going to do this one. And so I'll put it into my own portfolio and make a return Transactions I do, I range from, uh, you know, sometimes I'll make only 12 or 15% APR on the investment that I make on, on a piece of equipment. And sometimes, Tony, let me just say it's lots, lots more. Wow. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. So I'm involved with the NAELB Lease Brokers School because I'm just so excited to share the industry with other entrepreneurs or uh, planning to be entrepreneurs or anybody who wants to have a professional kind of a business, professional kind of an income, hold their head high when they describe what they do, work from home if they want to, or an office, solo or with staff, work from the golf course, work, work from the beach, or in my case, work from the jungle. And I just, I mean, I get a kick out of it. I get expired by my clients every day, seeing how they're solving problems that I never knew existed. Uh, you know, uh, it, it just, it's such a fun thing to do. I have no problem rolling out of bed, walking over to my office, which is in the next room, and uh, cranking up the computer and saying, let's see what the day's got for me today. This is going to be a good one. Very cool, Gary. I'm very inspired, and I'm taken in by your enthusiasm on this and your success so big applause for you on that that's very very cool i could be wrong but i don't think there's that many people and when i say that i mean the majority i do not think that the majority of the people have that pleasure have that 
perk where they're so happy to get to work and they can work at their own office at home. I think that's awesome <laughs> and yeah. very, very cool. So that's the uh, the school. And if anyone goes there to N-A-E-L-B-School.com, all the information will be there. Gary, can they reach you at this email at, excuse me, at this domain, can you be reached from there? Yes. Yeah, there's there's a contact page there, and uh, we were always glad to talk to folks. You know, we, we get to meet entrepreneurs, by, first by phone, uh, and they don't always know really what our business is all about, and so we do spend a fair amount of time, enough time as is necessary, however much time as is necessary, to help them understand, here's what it means to be a commercial equipment lease broker. There's a, yeah, I mean, if somebody found out about that by simply stumbling onto it, they probably have the wrong impression. My elevator speech, Tony, says I'm in the equipment leasing business and I am not in the equipment business at all. I don't specify it. I don't deliver it. I don't warranty it. I don't operate it. I'm just in the finance industry. So I tell people I'm in the equipment leasing business, but I'm not in the equipment business at all. And their eyebrows go up. And I said, now, and now that I have your attention, let me explain what I do. Exactly. <laughs> now, now you get into the real conversation. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. very, very cool, Gary. We're just about wrapped up here. I'm going to put in the notes and on the show to be the domain again. And I hope that the, the people that are looking at this to start up or looking at this for a business, I hope that they go and inquire and check it out. And we'll talk some more about promoting as well. And I just wanted to say thank you very much. It's been wonderful. It's been a pleasure. Love your enthusiasm. It's awesome. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, okay. And, and if I didn't need to apologize, I won't. But I, I do. I mean, I love I love what I do, and I love telling people about it. It is uh, it it charges me up every day. Well, very cool. Well, once again, everyone, the school's website is n a e l b school.com and if you need you'll see it in the show notes on uh, tony d-u-r-s-o.com just go to the blogs or go to the radio page all right well thank you again very much gary green and thank you audience and stay tuned to our next show on revenue chat we are going to have donnie p who says drive your business to success with five life-changing principles the author of how to catch a mouse with no cheese real-world lessons and experiences from an entrepreneur, personally lived and breathed what he now teaches by building his business with nothing more than a pad of paper, a pen, and an empty wallet. As a result, he gained personal wisdom and experience in the tremendous success of his home care services business. Donnie shares his hard-won wisdom and experience on the next episode of Revenue Chat. Listen to my other awesome interviews at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash radio. And please drop me a message. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And until next time, remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely. Choose wisely.